So the Queensland economy is primarily driven by four different industries, and those industries are mining, construction, tourism, and agriculture. So in the last 20 years, the area exposed to mining in Queensland has actually doubled. And this is due to global demand for coal and minerals from this region. And this has in turn driven an increase in the amount of port and shipping activity in the region. Into the future, port capacity is expected to triple in the next 10 years. And in the next 20 years, the number of boats visiting GBR ports is expected to double. The spatial footprint of mining is quite um, smaller relative to agriculture. 80% um, of the catchment, the GBR catchment, is exposed to agricultural activities such as grazing and intensive um, sugarcane. I have got a timer going on this, which is, means I'm going to have to go with it. Sorry about that. And um, so we also have federal government interventions which potentially might affect the way that agriculture productivity moves into the future. I'm actually sorry, could we stop the timer on this? Otherwise we just, um, can we, sorry, can we do that? Because there's a timer going on the slides. Okay, I'll just keep going. And so what potentially might happen into the future is if the white paper on, um, is that possible? Ah, oh, thank you. Can I just put my hand up when I want you to flick the slide? Okay, thanks very much. So what, we're, what we might see happening into the future is increase in agricultural activities in this particular region, which will in turn have effect on water quality. Population is expected to grow by about 1.6% every year into the future in the GBR region. And this is a little bit more than what we actually have within Australia as well. And in turn, that is going to put extra pressure on the coastal environment from coastal development and also from reef-based activities such as recreational fishing. On top of this, we have commercial fishing activities, which also exert impact, as well as climate change. So all of these different activities exert multiple cumulative impacts on the receiving environment, primarily the coastal environment. So these impacts include erosion, scouring, increased turbidity, and so on. So how do we even begin to understand the cumulative impacts of all of these activities put together? Next. OK, thank you. So, I attempted to do this in my PhD, so we used a pretty basic approach. We used a GIS-based approach where we took layers of um, activities um, that exert pressure on the marine environment, such as ports and shipping and water quality. We then measured the sensitivity of these activities, um, rather we mentioned the sensitivity of seagrasses to these activities. And then we compared these, the spatial distribution of the activities with the spatial di distribution of seagrass habitats to find areas which are exposed to multiple activities and also seagrass have a high sensitivity to those activities. And I presented this information to uh, a briefing to government as associated with the strategic assessment. And I particularly highlighted these deep red areas, which are sort of our hot spots for conservation action, where seagrass is most likely to be lost. And I was asked by a senior bureaucrat that attended this meeting, well, what does that mean for neighbouring habitats if we lose seagrass at this particular site? And it was a good question, and I didn't have a bloody answer for it. But four years later, I think I'm heading towards that answer now. It only took four years. Science is pretty slow. And the reason why these, this question is particularly important is because in the highly connected environments such as the GBR, if you're assessing an impact or the potential impact of a new development, you must be able to understand not only what happens at the particular site, but what that means for neighbouring locations. And this is very important for informing management actions such as offsets. So what do we know about seagrass connectivity in the GBR? Well, we know that seagrasses are clonal flowering plants, and that's where most of the research has been conducted. But we also know that seagrasses have evolved for long-distance dispersal, and that's because their seeds and propagules float, they're buoyant, so they must be going somewhere. And we also know that seagrasses invest a lot of energy into sexual reproduction. We also know, based upon genetic evidence by Michelle Waycott and others, that seagrass population structure is not always dominated by clonal processes. And we do have evidence of recruitment and recovery of seagrass habitats after large disturbance events. So we know that connectivity is 
definitely playing a role in the functioning and persistence of seagrass in this area, but we have no idea about the spatial patterns and scale of connectivity or the potential dispersal pathways or if there are critical source meadows. We don't know if there are or where they are if they do occur. And so in this particular project, what we, use, what we did is develop hydrodynamic models of the region to predict the dispersal of seagrass and their settlement and there's use, use that information in a network analysis to better understand connectivity and what might happen to seagrass connectivity under change. And to do this, we needed to assemble a team. And as Dr Carl alluded to last night, <clears throat> some science questions re require you to access people from the entire autism spectrum. And that's what we did here. And I'm about here, or here, depending on where you look. So we have our seagrass ecologists, which include people from Trop Water up in Cairns and the University of Adelaide. And we also have our numer numerical modellers who developed the SLIM model that we use. And they're based at University Catholic de Levan in Belgium. You then add me and you sprinkle a little bit of money on it and you got yourself a research team. So to simulate the dispersal of seagrass propagules, we use the two-dimensional SLIM model. This model was developed and calibrated in about 2008 by the group at UCL. It's been used to model the dispersal of turtle hatchlings and fish and sediment as well. Uh, it's is made of unstructured grids of variable resolution, so the closer you are to a reef or to the uh, coastline, the finer the scale of the resolution of the grid, so you can capture that variability. We used real wind speed and direction uh, data and tide data for the, during the seagrass reproductive period to develop the model, and then we used a particle tracker to model the dispersal of um, virtual seagrass propagules in the region. And so our study region was the central GBR from Repulse Bay in the south to just north of Hinchinbrook Island. And in this area, there are about 100 discrete seagrass meadows. And we break those meadows into two different species types, the structurally robust foundation species and the non-foundation species, which are primarily halophila. We ran 34 simulations over the reproductive period to capture all the variability in wind and tide and so on. And we also modelled seagrass propagules floating at the surface and also suspended below the surface. So we did this for each of the different start dates, making 68 simulations. We released over 150,000 um, particles per simulation across 317 release sites. And the simulation length was about eight weeks for each of these 68 simulations. That's about how long seagrasses live for. But we also have um, seagrass propagules, rather. But we also incorporated a decay function so that after about a week and a half, 50% of the particles had settled. So in regards to what are the main drivers of seagrass dispersal and sort of what kind of results we got, we found the mean dispersal distance for floating particles was about 60 kilometres and 33.8 kilometres for suspended particles. And this is an example here from Abbott Point. I didn't dare to put in animations. So the work I'm showing you here is very similar to what Mike Bobe was showing yesterday as well as Hugo. So in those nice simulations they had the little particles running around. That's what we did, but I didn't dare do it. I couldn't even get the timings right on this either. <laughs> so we also found that the maximum dispersal distance we had was about 1,000 kilometres. So even though the mean, and the mean dispersal distance seems quite low, we actually had quite a lot of particles going quite far as well. And you can see here that we had differences in those um, depending upon whether it was floating or suspended. So the direction of connectivity follows this South, very strong southeast trade winds that you get at this time of year. And that's for both foundation um, and non foundation species and for floating and suspended species um, uh, models as well. And we use a linear mixed effects model to test for the effect of different predictive variables on, uh, on the um, Euclidean distance that these particles moved. And we found that distance to coast and month of release were significant factors. And so the further you are away from the coast, the more exposed to minimum wave activity you are, the further you're going to move. And the later you are released in the season, the less windy it gets, so the less far you're going to move. And that is demonstrated here. You can see that um, particles released in November travelled a lot less than particles that released in August. We then used this information from the 100 meadows and the 68 simulations and all of that data to populate connectivity matrices, which we then used in a network analysis. So here are our two networks. We have our foundation and non-foundation network. So that each meadow is represented by a node or a circle. The size of that meadow, um, the size of that node represents its betweenness centrality, and that gives an indication of if that meadow is acting as a stepping stone because it falls along the shortest path between other meadows. 
The different colours of the nodes represent their communities. So these are areas or nodes rather meadows that are more connected to each other than to other meadows. And the lines um, connecting all of these different nodes are the num uh, represent the number of particles moving from X to Y. And so just by looking at these networks and getting some network measures associated with them, we can see that they actually function as small world networks, meaning that they have, um, they, because they have a short network diameter and they also are very connected, so these networks are highly connected, which means that they're very robust to perturbation events because there's lots of redundancies in these networks. And here we can show them spatially as well, so we have our different communities represented here, and we have once again, a predominant southeast movement of these of connectivity, except in the foundation, non-foundation networks, we have a lot of movement from the deep water into the shallow water as well. So we have that kind of direction happening too. The meadows with the highest amount of outflux or that were producing the most particles that landed on other meadows were from our big meadows such as Abbott Point, rather around Abbott Point, Townsville, Upstart Bay, and the deep water meadows too. Now the interesting thing about Upstart Bay was that it had a very high local retention rate so 98% of the particles that landed on the seagrass meadow in Upstart Bay were from Upstart Bay, which means that it has very high self-replenishment. But it also means it could be quite at risk of a major disturbance event because it's less likely to be reseeded from neighbouring locations. We then use this information and use this network data to assess what might happen if you start removing nodes as a result of cumulative impacts. And the impacts that we looked at were Cyclone Yassi, Cyclone Debbie, Cyclone Hamish, the city and port of Townsville um, flooding event at Burdekin, as well as the port of Abbott Point. And so we assume that meadows that were over these areas were completely destroyed. We then removed them from the network and reran the networks, created new network measures and then assessed how different these networks were from the original networks. And what we found was that for foundation species, the biggest impact occurred when you remove the city and port of Townsville nodes. And for non-foundation species, it was when you remove the deep water nodes. But we ran about every combination of these different um, hazard events together to see, sort of, to assess cumulative impact. And what we found was, for example, that if you remove nodes or remove the meadows at Cleveland Bay, that causes more damage than if you remove all the meadows at Upstart Bay and Abbott Point and so on. So we're still working on this analysis, but we can basically draw from it that even though these hazard events do cause damage at a local scale, the impact on connectivity, yes, it does occur, but this, this region and the seagrasses in this region are very robust to perturbation events because they're so highly connected. Even when we removed all the meadows associated with these different hazard events, the met, the, we couldn't break this network into different components. It was impossible to reduce its connectivity. Seagrasses have evolved that way. This is Cyclone Alley that we're looking at. They're used to perturbation events. They're built for it. So in regards to opportunities for seagrass recovery, to go back to that question that the government bureaucrat who's now retired and is living life quite freely probably on the Gold Coast, to answer his question, what does it mean losing seagrass at one location for other locations? Well, it does potentially have an impact, but that impact might not be so great because the networks are so connected together and it's quite complicated. These networks are very densely connected and which makes them robust to perturbation events. And the further evidence of this is that seagrasses are quite quick to recover after major disturbance events, such as around the Cleveland Bay area in 2012. Those seagrasses have come back and they've come back quickly and they've come back very healthy as well. So from a management... Um, also, and in, in addition to that, we not only have sort of abiotic dispersal happening for seagrasses, we have multi-directional connectivity as a result of the movement of seeds from dugong and turtle poo as well. And these can move up to 650 kilometres, which is quite significant. And they can move from north to south as well. From a management perspective, what we really should be doing is not worrying so much about connectivity in the seagrass environment, but habitat quality. So you cannot, uh, seagrass habitat cannot recover from a major perturbation event if there is low light as a result of poor water quality, if the sediment isn't right because of dredging. So what we need to be doing is focusing on management activities which maintain habitat quality. 
And this is also important from a restoration perspective. So rest seagrass restoration is being touted as an opportunity for offset funding. Now, the reality is these networks are so connected. Even Upstart Bay, with 98% self-replenishment, has the opportunity to recover naturally because it can be replenished from neighbouring habitats. If you do want to do restoration, you have to fix the location anyways. You have to make sure that the habitat quality is up for it. And so what we think in this particular case for seagrasses in the central GBR, if it's good enough for restoration, it's going to recover naturally anyways. So you're better off spending your money on something else. And that's it. Thank you very much.